Colombian authorities have captured three Venezuelans who participated in the failed plan to invade Venezuela and overthrow the government of Nicolas Maduro. Polls have closed in Jamaica where general elections were held this Thursday in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. South African healthcare personnel took to the streets on Thursday to demand better working conditions. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Colombia where authorities captured three Venezuelans who participated in the failed plan to invade Venezuela. The news was reported by the Association Press Agency and later confirmed by the Colombian newspaper El Tiempo, which cites an intelligence report and shared a photo of the three detainees. The individuals were two brothers, Juvenel Sequeira and Joven Sequeira, former officers of the Bolivarian National Guard of Venezuela, implicated in the Operation Gideon failed invasion of the country, as well as a woman, Raida Russo, who was with them at the time of the arrest and is accused of paying for the shipment of weapons to the paramilitary camp set up in Colombia to train the mercenaries of Operation Gideon. In response to the news, Colombian President Ivan Duque sought to completely twist the version of events, announcing that an operation that sought to destabilize Colombia had been thwarted, while accusing the Venezuelan government of financing the operation. And in response to the claims by the Colombian president, Ivan Duque, Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arias stressed on Twitter that Venezuelan authorities had provided intelligence over two years on the plans to destabilize Venezuela from Colombian territory, which the Colombian authorities ignored, even protecting those involved in the conspiracies, including Venezuelan military deserters turned mercenaries. And also in Venezuela, the Great Patriotic Poll, an electoral alliance that brings together nine political parties, has registered its candidates for the parliamentary elections of December 6. First Lady Celia Flores, speaking on behalf of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, said that the time had come to rescue the National Assembly, while stressing that the country's legislative power has been destroyed by a right-wing sector that has damaged the country. She called for broad participation in the upcoming vote to ensure the National Assembly once again responds to the interests of the Venezuelan people. Chile's lower chamber has passed a bill that revokes a mandatory waiting term for divorced women to remarry. The move brought an end to a 160-year-old law that forced women, unlike men, to wait nine months for the right to remarry after divorce or becoming a widow. Minister of Women and Gender Equality, Monica Salaket, said the approval of the bill represented good news for women and a major step in building a fairer Chile, as both men and women would now be, have the freedom to rebuild their lives for a second marriage without discrimination. The previous legislation was supposedly intended to dispel doubts over the paternity of children born from future relationships. Chile continues to face further challenges to tackle gender inequality, including addressing the gender pay gap, the disproportionate figures of men compared to women in leadership roles, and disparities in access to social services. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador assured that his government would not raise taxes in the 2021 budget plan to be presented before Congress on September 9th. Although the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a devastating effect on the economy, the president emphasized that to recover, other alternatives have to be found, but that raising taxes or increasing the public debt are not options. He also recalled that in previous administrations, when there was a crisis, people were told that they had to tighten their belts. But now the government is tightening its belt. And the Mexican Chamber of Deputies approved the elimination of presidential immunity. With 420 votes in favour, none against and 15 abstentions, the lower chamber approved the amendment of Articles 108 and 111 of the Mexican Constitution, allowing for the possibility of a president to be tried for any crime. The proposal came from President Andrés Manuel López Obrador, who stressed that the dishonesty and corruption of former presidents damaged Mexican society. Polls have closed in Jamaica, where general elections were held this Thursday in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Polls closed at 5 p.m. local time, while the Electoral Commission has reported that 30.67% of registered voters had cast their ballots up to 2 p.m., taking into account reports from 89% of polling stations across the island. The Electoral Office noted that over 1.9 million people were registered to vote, while 139 candidates, including 13 independents, were contesting the 63 seats of the House of Representatives. Meanwhile, polls showed that current Pres Prime Minister Andrew Holness, representing the ruling Jamaica Labour Party had a lead of 12 to 19 points over the opposition People's National Party, led by former Finance Minister Peter Phillips.
Candidates' campaigns were dominated by discussions on the economy, how to fight crime and the response to the coronavirus pandemic. The last general elections were held in 2016, where the Jamaica Labour Party secured 32 seats. Jamaican health authorities have reported over 2,000 COVID-19 cases and 27 fatalities. Spanish health authorities noted on Thursday that the country has seen a fall in its COVID-19 death rate, despite the recent spike in new cases. The increases we are seeing in France and Spain are accompanied by a decrease in the mortality rate in both countries. At the beginning of the epidemic in March and April, the rate was 13% in Spain and in France over the same date, it was up to 18% for a couple of weeks. Presently in Spain, it is now down as an average over the whole of the pandemic to 6% and France to 10.5%. The number of PCR tests have been notified by this Monday are in the high range of nearly 80,000. The days of highest rate diagnosis of the results are Monday, Tuesday and Thursday. The numbers can be between 80 or 90,000. The number of Monday of positive tests was slightly down. It was 10.4 percent. This shows the possible slowing down or reduction of the speed of contagion. The hundreds of thousands of so-called irregular immigrants living in Spain have been left out of the government aid promised by the executive branch to relieve the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this context, several sectors are calling for the regularization of this vulnerable community. Last March, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in Spain, President Pedro Sánchez made a promise. He was talking about financial assistance to vulnerable workers and companies that would alleviate the COVID-19 consequences. However, he forgot one vulnerable group, irregular immigrants. All these promises that the government has made to all those people who are Spanish or have a legal residence, they did not receive them. Imagine a person who is in an irregular administrative situation, who has no access to anything, who has been left abandoned. And of course, the slogan of no one has been left behind is a lie. As a particularly vulnerable group, they have lived and are living a particularly hard moment with this pandemic. The housing conditions for immigrants in an irregular situation prevent them from abiding by the measures of strict confinement or social distancing. You have to think that many of them are hanging together on small apartments where that is simply impossible. The children do not have the technological resources to continue the classes as many of our children have had during this time, because when you work in the submerged economy, you cannot ask for help. Living in the margins of government reconstruction plans, irregular immigrants survive thanks to their self-organization and the help of other associations and NGOs. They are living from the aid boxes that, as migrant collectives, we have created. They are either living from Caritas or they are receiving support from any association that has social consciences and that fights so that no one is left behind for real. As studied by the Causa Foundation, Carlos III University challenges prejudice about irregular immigrants in Spain and shows a profile. They are mostly Latin American, young and arrive regularly. Making them legal immigrants is not only a humanitarian obligation, but it would be a contribution to the development of Spain, says the report. This has been demonstrated in other countries of the Union, such as Germany. If they were allowed to work in whatever they do, but to make contributions to social security and pay direct taxes as all workers in this country do, their contribution would be possible with a value of 3,250 euros per person every year. These associations ask the government of Spain to follow the example of other countries, such as Portugal and Italy. They have carried out regularization processes during the pandemic. Edu Marín y Adriana Cardoso, Telesur, Madrid. Chinese President Xi Jinping stressed the great spirit of resisting aggression in the new era as part of the Victory Day commemorations, marking the 75th anniversary of the Chinese victory over Japan in World War II. On addressing a symposium held by the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee, President Xi said the Chinese people had demonstrated to the world their patriotism, national character, heroism and strong will, which led to the victory of the Chinese People's War of Resistance against Japanese aggression and the world anti-fascist war. He stressed that the great spirit of resisting aggression bred during the war is an invaluable source of inspiration and will always motivate the Chinese people to overcome all difficulties and obstacles and strive to achieve national rejuvenation. 
Here, on half the Communist Party of China Central Committee, the National People's Congress, the State Council, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, the Central Military Commission, I would like to express my highest respect to all the veterans who fought the war of the Chinese people's resistance against the Japanese aggression, to all the senior comrades, patriotic personnel and war generals, and to all the Chinese at home and abroad who made historic contributions to the victory of this war. And experts and officials from several countries spoke highly of the Chinese people's brave resistance to the Japanese attacks and invasion during the conflict of 1931 to 1945. Japan's invention war should never be forgiven. It was definitely a wrongful and stupid action of war. In the future, Japan must stick to the thought that we should never repeat this mistake of starting a war. China is always um, uh, represents its aspiration, you know, for Africa and a number of uh, countries all over the world. And by that time, you know, uh, so many countries were uh, in Africa were under uh, colonial rule. Uh, for us, China was setting a very good example to be followed uh, by uh, by 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 nations, you know, by the people of a country to get emancipation and get uh, their freedom. We highly appreciate Chinese people's brave resistance against foreign invasion. We strongly agree with President Xi Jinping that our country has to depend on itself to safeguard its sovereignty. And meanwhile, the political tensions between Washington and Beijing intensify. China's foreign ministry stressed this Thursday that restrictions on Chinese diplomatic missions in the United States are a serious violation of international law. Since October last year, the U.S. State Department has been imposing restrictions on the normal operation of Chinese diplomatic and consular missions under staff in the U.S. This is a serious violation of the international law and the basic norms of international relations and seriously interferes with China-United States relations and normal bilateral exchanges. We urge the U.S. State Department to immediately revoke this wrong decision, stop obstructing normal personal exchanges between the two countries, and stop undermining China-U.S. relations. China will make a proper and necessary response based on the development of the situation. Over 100 healthcare personnel took to the streets in South Africa on Thursday to demand better working conditions and to urge the government to end corruption in the purchase of COVID-19 personal protective equipment. Demonstrators gathered in Pretoria and Cape Town, claiming that healthcare workers were at risk due to the lack of adequate PPE, such as surgical masks. Protesters have demanded danger pay for workers who are on the front line of the battle against COVID-19, noting that despite the losses and risks, they have received no compensation. Meanwhile, representatives of the National Education, Health and Allied Workers Union have announced that over 200,000 public workers will go on strike on September 10th if their demands are not addressed. Health authorities have reported more than 600,000 COVID-19 cases, representing the largest number in Africa and the seventh highest in the world, while over 27,000 health workers have tested positive for the virus, of which 230 have died. We cannot keep quiet anymore while healthcare workers are dying in various facilities because of COVID-19. We are saying we cannot keep quiet while our healthcare workers are getting infections at the facilities because the employer is unable to provide adequate PPE in the facilities. We are saying enough is enough that we don't want 0% increase because throughout COVID, public servants have been working. We've been saving lives of politicians. We've been saving lives of society in general. So we don't become essential workers and critical workers only when it's convenient of them to call us essential workers. Because our lives as public servants as workers in South Africa, does not mean anything to the government of today. So we must be prepared to fight commerce. This is the battle that we are starting today. We are going to fight, and we must tell them that we are great. The new Tunisian government took office this Thursday morning. New Prime Minister Hichem Michichi and his team of mainly technocrats face the complicated task of bringing Tunisia's young democracy out of political instability to meet the country's socio-economic challenges. 
I am convinced that it is not possible to find solutions to the problems of the economy, growth, poverty, unemployment, regional imbalance and marginalization as long as there is no moralization of political life and rationalization, no protection from dirty money and everyone assumes their responsibilities. The composition of this government took place in a context characterized by instability and a few months after the legislative election and in a context of great expectations of citizens to achieve a concrete change in their economic and social situation, which has deteriorated in recent years. The United States has withdrawn an important part of its humanitarian aid to Ethiopia due to the lack of progress in talks with Egypt and Sudan over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. The U.S. government claimed the decision responded to concern about Ethiopia's unilateral decision to begin to fill the dam before an agreement and all necessary dam safety measures were in place. The three nations continue to be locked in a dispute over the operation of the dam that Ethiopia has been building on the Blue Nile River since 2011. The move marked an unusual example of Trump's direct intervention on an issue in Africa, a continent he hasn't visited as president and rarely mentions publicly. Syria's anti-air defense units repelled Israeli missile attacks against the Tiyas Air Base in Homs on Wednesday night. According to an army officer quoted by the Syrian news agency Sana, several missiles were launched by the Israeli regime from the southern city of Al Tanth. The report revealed that despite some damages to property, there are no major material damages. Syria has effectively tackled bombings by the Israeli regime against positions of Syrian forces several times. In this regard, the Syrian authorities stressed that Tel Aviv and its allies continue in their efforts to oust the government of President Bashar al-Assad. Jordan plans to resume international flights next week with a three-tiered system to isolate and track travellers who may have been exposed to the coronavirus. Transportation Minister Khalid Saeed said Thursday that all passengers must be tested 72 hours before their departure to Jordan and again on arrival once international flights resume on Tuesday. Those arriving from green countries, that is those considered of low risk, will not be required to quarantine if their test is negative. People from yellow or red countries will have to spend seven days in institutional quarantine and another seven in home quarantine. Anyone arriving from red countries will have to wear tracking bracelets while in home quarantine. The country of 10 million has one of the lowest infection rates in the region, with just over 2,000 cases and 15 COVID-19 deaths. Malaysia, Al -Maghrib, Poland, Thailand. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko claimed Thursday his security forces had intercepted German calls showing that Russian opposition figure Alexei Navalny's poisoning had been faked. Lukashenko told visiting Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Misustin in Minsk that the call between Berlin and Warsaw showed that the incident was a falsification and there was no poisoning. The Belarusian president noted he would hand over the transcript to Russia's security services. We intercepted an interesting conversation between Berlin and Warsaw. I will share it with you. Once everything is ready, we will forward it to the FSB. This conversation clearly proved that the poison of Navalny is a falsification. Navalny has absolutely not been poisoned. Indian health authorities have detected almost 84,000 new coronavirus cases in a single day. According to a report from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases has now reached over 3.9 million, of which over 3 million have recovered. Meanwhile, the death toll stands at over 68,000. India is the third most affected country by the pandemic, and experts believe it could soon take over Brazil and the United States in terms of the number of cases. Japanese Coast Guard rescuers searched Thursday for the remaining 42 crew members of a ship believed to have sunk in a typhoon after a lone survivor was found bobbing in a life jacket. The Gulf Livestock One, which was carrying a cargo of nearly 6,000 cows, issued a distress call in the early hours of Wednesday from a position 185 kilometers west of Japan's Amami Oshimi Island. Japan's Coast Guard dispatched planes and rescue boats to hunt for the ship and late Wednesday found a sole survivor. The man told rescuers that he had put on a life jacket and dived into the sea after a warning announcement on board on Wednesday when powerful Typhoon Mysak was passing through the area. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many of our stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellyso English, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.